Good afternoon. Um, transmedial archaeology. Yes. Well, transmedia in textuality works to position consumers as powerful players while disavowing commercial manipulation. It levels ideological conflict. Allegedly. Wrote Marsha Kinder, who's a somewhat transmedial and intertextual academic in her own right. She's published over 100 essays with a range of books and films across a breadth of genres uh, since the 60s. Authors of narrative is her thread. And she coined the term transmedia to encompass interactive, multifaceted platforms as a seed for change in which ideological conflicts within established and reforming narratives can seek to attain unification. It seeks to do this with normally competing communities. And instead of battling, they give an equal space to communicate in their own manner without the insidious antagonism of hierarchy. It isn't about diluting everybody and everything into one uniform consensus. Rather, it's about facilitating different expressions of one narrative through a plethora of portals. An example of this would be the Indiana Jones franchise. And this began not, as you might think, with the Raiders of the Lost Ark in 1981, but with a film called The Secret of the Incas in 1954. Since then, it spanned a rewrite, sequels, books, comics, toys, television show, you name it. Archaeology's had an Indiana Jones face for it. Until now, the only people left creating about it are the audience themselves via formats such as Minecraft and, believe it or not, cosplay. It's inspired generations of people to investigate archaeology and been used to both build and break down stereotypes within the field. And thus it's reached over the boundaries of commercial control into adventures of its own. Transmedia storytelling of this kind has become so embedded in our culture during the last 20 years the Carl Scolari and Indra Libras point out that we now have the official professional credit of transmedia producer in the US, which we don't yet have in the UK. Along with various transmedial funding schemes and similar processes in place across the European Union, such as the media programme and its associated support networks in member countries. But we don't have the equivalent here. It's a subject that has fascinated many scholars of digital media over the last decade. In an interview with Henry Jenkins of the University of Southern California, Marsha Kinder stated that these expansions can yield more than just revenue. She'd always been convinced there's an important interplay between artistic experimentation and theoretical breakthroughs. Amongst others, she, she cites Marcel Proust's Al Recherche de Trompe Du, having inspired Gerard Jeannette's narrative discourse and essay and method, which any narrative archaeologist in the room will be familiar. It's a relevant case in point, and it goes on to explain how the friction created by having art and academia interact can open hitherto unexplored theoretical discussions, such as that uh, by Alison McHale referred to before, and also those that Henry Jenkins has experimented with. As a specialist in learning through participatory culture and public engagement, Jenkins' research is distinct from other transmedial academics in being prolifically involved in connecting academic research with the media industry, predominantly by developing new ways of thinking through old problems. He defines transmedia as being a flow of content through multiple flat platforms. It flows through multiple platforms because it is a narrative so large it cannot be covered in a single medium, just like archaeology. He considers, it, he considers it to be the ideal aesthetic form for an era of collective intelligence. Pierre Rave coined the term collective intelligence to refer to new social structures to enable the production and circulation of knowledge within a network society. Participants pull information and tap each other's expertise as they work together to solve problems to form new knowledge communities. Transmedia narratives also function as textual activators, setting into motion the production, assessment and archiving of information and reflecting the economics of media consolidation or what industry observers called synergy. So how does this relate to the practice of archeology? span Well, this is where another form of transmedia comes in, 
the deep map. Now, deep mapping is another uh, perspective upon multivocality, and it took hold in the 90s, uh, this time with William Least Heat Moon's travel book, Prairie Earth, and the concept was famously appropriated by uh, the Mikes, Shanks, and Pearson in conjunction with Cliff McCookus through theatre archaeology in the guise of Brief Gore. Now, their practice changed the face of performative archaeology as essentially a, a response to landscape that was site specific and attempting to represent place by juxtapos juxtaposing often tensioned approach approaches to the same locale. Now, as transmedia projects utilize a melange of different semiotic modes in order to reinforce one another, they are also a form of deep map, where a mixture of voices, as those we heard about earlier with museology, can interdigitate to further a single overarching objective that speaks to a wider audience than each factor could attain on their own. Thus, it feeds out into a wider funding agenda. Both are concerned with the reconstruction of knowledge through building story worlds, where story refers to a narrative trajectory that is not static, but are dynamic modes of evolving situations. Now, with the exception of Marie Ryan, transmediality is generally concerned with representing what is usually a fiction through media-centric platforms, whereas the notion of deep mapping does not make this differentiation. It doesn't look to the difference between fact, fiction, arts or science, and it need not be constrained with any particular format. What they do instead is reflect dis different aspects of one another. For it's a trajectory, a single uh, constellation of shifting impulses, in many ways ultimately educational, rather than a unified set of technical approaches or creative methodology. It works against the grain of disciplinary exclusivity, re-narrating the world in ways not preconditioned by the real politic of epistemological status quo that maintains a culture of possessive individualism. It's for this reason that deep mapping cuts across the methods of the sciences and the arts, playing with their relationship as a means to reconfigure social memory and place identity by activating testimonial imagination in response to the recovery of spectral traces of forgotten or untold pasts, deep mappings act educationally, critically bridging otherwise antagonistic positions and stories so as to provoke new understandings. Provoking new understandings is the linchpin here with, with Ian Biggs's opinion. For by altering our usual way of looking, we can remove the restrictive boundaries placed upon orthodox delineations we can dissolve this fantasy of otherness that allows for convention to be dismantled intellectually. A variety of agendas can therefore be accommodated across a single multi-layered nexus, one text through many worlds relation or through a one world across many texts relation. In this term, the uh, world is a little ambiguous as it may refer to a set of context defined ontological properties of fiction or fact or to a user-centric field of reference. Mm -hmm. Either way, it follows a, a proper notion of journeying to another kingdom, where one inhabits a different reality through the imagination. This is essentially what the archaeologist does when interpreting. We have a teleological code to which we adhere our imagination. We immerse ourselves in the conceptual landscape we're uncovering with every spit and trench, building a world in our minds with every stone we move. With experience, we bring a dearth of extra diuses to add or hinder our world-building view, and we refer and add to the collective foreknowledge of landscape and archaeological historicity. The past people and places we encounter become personal to the extent that we may succumb to the effect of fictional homelessness when our research is completed, just as a gamer or may feel when he returns to his empirical reality. The information we produce as archaeologists rapidly becomes a web of sub-disciplines that can transcend the world of a dig, sometimes with a dig concerned taking on legendary status as its history is regenerated through every telling to the archaeologists who come after or through media outputs such as television shows and Facebook, or through Minecraft. However, 
To apply Tim Engel's words, words from lines of brief history, the core is always directed down a trail following method, which is largely destination orientated, predetermined by the funding agenda they're obliged to honour. Where transmedial and transfiction world building can go further than this, it can wayfare, where wayfaring is described as more akin to sailing in the open sea, with no pre-planned route or navigation appliances, and the possibility of anchoring in the harbour of one's own choice. This is a little tricky to present in a funding bid, because it's quantifiable only in retrospect. It doesn't entirely follow a checklist of predetermined aims and objectives, nor does it fit comfortably into a time scale. When applied to archaeology, this can allow for an opening of both expression and method that leads one away from the conventional sources of funding and into dangerous waters where art and science are forced to meet. Geomythology sits as a bridge across this water where the two face each other. It examines stories for geological and geographical content, seeking the tangible within the intangible. Geology, geography and mythology are commonly divided into competing communities within the same physical landscape, with the arts coming a poor runner-up. However, within geomythology, there exists potential for them to instead be harnessed together to ease these boundaries into a shared engagement with both space and time. Academic and non-academic sectors can take an equal stand. Science can hold hands with story. But this requires a radical reappraisal of how we finance and supervise research that does not fit neatly into our long established boundaries. My experience thus far has been that whilst funding bodies and institutions may claim to want to be interdisciplinary and devoid of ivory towers separating insiders from outsiders, when it actually comes to directing the money or devising marketing strategies, the practical implications of spreading over, say, 11 different disciplines the way I do, results in a rapid reversal of enthusiasm. And who can blame them? We therefore don't need to just deep map a physical landscape or express our story transmedially. We need to deep map an entire academic perspective. For surely, one of the values of archaeology is its ability to cross-pollinate and position itself as a conduit for changing perceptions and landscapes of both the ground and the imagination. Somebody needs to fund that. Geomythology is a prime example of this. Archaeological representation has a track record of being able to regenerate old narratives to suit a more enlightened century, redefining knowledge production and gradually reconstructing power alliances, predominantly through the work of Steph Moser at Southampton. So we're not without hope, even though it's not easy to navigate the political minefield of ploughing up outmoded ways of thinking. For geomythology, this ploughing involves convincing geoscience that stories are not merely the, the fanciful wanderings of overactive imaginations that occasionally get detail right, and also in convincing storytellers that science is not just the dry dungeon of Spock-like insensitivity. Room has to be made within thinking for modes of presenting research that do not fit within these structures. It also involves convincing the funding bodies that these non-traditional structures are commercially pragmatic and that stories are more than just puppets for public engagement to be tracked on at the end of projects to tick a box indicating community awareness. Well done. They're a method and a portal in their own right. Just as science can be utilised to trigger a storytelling bonanza with or without Indy's hat and whip. By way of example, let me close, if I have time, by presenting a short film um, I've produced in collaboration with a small team of other experts. This film is a, an archaeological representation of a specific landscape, Cardigan Bay. It's transmedial in that it contains six responses to one story, that of Bender Gavon's crossing to Ireland from the Mabinogi, and expresses them, through, expresses them through a variety of media constrained within one digital output. It's also a deep map, because it facilitates a multiplicity of site-specific voices in layers that interlace, 
be generating control of our own narrative imagery as archaeologists in an accessible, ethically savvy format. The purpose of this film is to expose the landscape that remains hidden, to unzip its purse and see what treasure lies there beneath the normative surface. It aims to lead people into questioning the manner in which narratives from opposing directions can come together to change the way each other thinks about space and place and history. It regenerates an old story into a new way of looking, responding to the agenda of a community which values both its mythologies and its science rather than to any external sponsor or examiner. Foucault points out that judicial systems of power produce the subjects they subsequently come to represent. Judicial notions of power appear to regulate political life in purely negative terms. But the subjects regulated by such structures are, by virtue of being subjected to them, formed, defined and reproduced in accordance with the requirements of those structures. So I suggest that if this is so, then let's build a new structure. Let's build a new world that's in accordance with our collective intelligence rather than being divided. As such, do we have time to run the film? Okay. Bendy Guybran sailed towards Ireland, and the sea was not wide then. Bendy Guybran waded across. There were only two rivers, called the Tli and the Archan. Later the sea spread out, but it flooded the kingdom. Extraordinary news. We have seen a forest on the sea where we never before saw a single tree.
That's one way we could do it. Thank you.